after, after such a fantastic lunch. Um, and uh, uh, I, I don't know that I, have, I should really be saying anything to you at all. And we're also a little bit over time. Um, I, it, was, it was really inspiring to hear what Themis Vokos had achieved in the past, uh, past 50 years. And um, I guess now we have to turn to the future and think about what everybody out there is going to achieve during the same period, because I think what was very clear was that he made his future, he made his, his luck, and he worked things forward. So um, I'm going to talk to you about shipping um, in an era of change, but this is a financial conference. So I'm, first of all, unfortunately, I'm going to have to show you my uh, disclaimer. Um, and uh, uh, just to remind you that you shouldn't take the things that are said by maritime economists too seriously because we're not really uh, rocket scientists, if you can read that from the back. Uh, can, you, can you actually see the slides at the back? Yeah, put, okay, well, give me a wave if you can't and I'll spend a bit more time talking about them. Uh, so, you know, unfortunately, what I can say to you about the future is rather like that rocket in the, um, it's, 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 the bits don't really quite fit together very well. And what I've spent the last three or four years doing on the decarbonization theme is trying to um, see how you piece things together. And what I'm going to give you, there's been so much said already this morning that what I'm going to try and do is to piece together the, the, the different bits of the rocket as, um, uh, it, uh, as I go through. And the first one, I think that you have to be very thoughtful about the timeline. Um, it's the, the, the trouble with the future and a future when it's a period of change is there's three big problems. Um, the first big problem is there's a lot more decisions to make. Um, the second big problem is that you don't ha you have even less information per decision than you had in normal times. So you're making decisions with inadequate information. Um, and the third problem is that you spend most of your time worrying about whether you're worrying about the right things. And so, uh, you know, a lot of this is about positioning yourself. And so I'll start with the timeline and how you, I think you can, you can divide the future up in a way which will help you to see what you're going to look at. Um, Secondly, the potential for green maritime fuels. We've all discussed that. I'm not, I'll just, I've just got one point to make, really, about that, and I, I don't think many of you will disagree. Um, the third is the other ways to fade out, phase out carbon emissions. There are lots and lots of them. Uh, but, um, and then, of course, it's all very well having green fuels and new technology and all this stuff, but you, somebody's got to build the ships. I mean, you know, it takes 25 years to build a fleet of ships, so you've got the problem which previous um, ship owners faced of uh, what you do when the technology's changing all the time. I mean, I, I think the analogy between the, the move from sail to steam and from de and decarbonization is, uh, is very a very close one and I mean if you'd been a ship owner in the 1860s you would have been ch changing your engine every 10 years probably I mean the, the fuel consumption of a steamship f fell by 80% between 1860 and 1914 so you know you couldn't run old ships if you ran old ships it, it was very problematic and then finally retrofitting and business building and I think my recommendation in the short term is to focus very hard on retrofitting as a way of getting to know your fleet intimately in detail and getting the people in the fleet on the ships and at shore to work together and of getting in the technical people you need in order to make those, ship, those old ships work perfectly. And if you can do that, you'll find you're building a, a new sort of business and one that you're not really used to. And it's not all that expensive compared with a new ship. So let me just scoot through this. Um, the strategic uh, timeline is basically that, um, I mean, zero carbon is a long way. You're not uh, a long way off. You're not going to get there very easily. Um, it can't be planned. 
in a normal way any more than in the old days you could really plan a voyage. The way you got from A to B in ancient times, well, not even in ancient times, was by dead reckoning. Every single day you checked your position against whatever information you could get and you corrected course continuously. And I think that's what the sort of thing we're moving towards. Um, technology is changing in the same way as ocean currents and you're going to need new skills and that means that all the different parts of the business are going to have to work together in a way that has not been true in the past. I mean, it's, you know, it's very difficult to get the people on ships who are spread around the world to work closely with people on shore. And, um, you know, I don't need to go into it. I'll come back to that later. But anyway, these are, the, these are my three timelines. The short term... Uh, we've heard a lot about CII management, and I, I, I don't totally think you should be obstructive about CII or be negative about CII. I mean, whatever else has happened, the IMO has thrown, uh, is challenging the shipping industry to start to measure its performance, to get some of, the, to really look at how it is performing. And if you read what they say on the website, it's not that draconian. I mean, basically, if you end up with a D ship, you've got tight, you, you present a plan. And um, if, in fact, you've got a, a low grade because you're spending 170 days in port in the year, then, to be quite honest, if you're interested, uh, and, and in fact, if, you're, if your generators are actually not working as efficiently as they should, you're running them slow speed, that sort of thing, you should be looking hard at how you minimize your, uh, you should be focusing on how, what you do in port, not, um, uh, and that really is the objective of that sort of approach. The, um, the second phase, and you do your planning, the second phase, four to ten years, is a chance to build a new business, um, build skills and technology, not very many companies have got much technical depth now. I mean, when Costas started City University course in the early 80s, most Greek principals had gone to Newcastle or South Shields or Durham or, or um, uh, Plymouth or somewhere and done naval architecture or marine engineering. Now, of course, a lot of people are good at finance, but they haven't done the the technology side. Somebody now in future is going to have to do that technology. And um, that means getting teams to work together uh, and running ships like, uh, like factories, not uh, like transport factories, rather than as semi, uh, you know, as what we know we've done and been very successful in doing for the last 30 years. Um, I don't think there's much you can do of for the period after 2030. You just have to wait and see what happens with the technology. Um, but I think there's going to be a way station there. And um, just to illustrate this, I, I'd never really looked at the numbers, but I pulled out the UK's average temperature since 1884. These are probably quite accurate numbers. And you can see in this chart that... Um, the, the, the first part of the series, up to 1980, I used to fix this trend, the green, tre the green dotted trend. And as you can see, we are, um, if, if things had gone on post-1980, then we would have a much, in the UK, a much lower temperature than we had in 2022. And in fact, if you now add the trend between 1980 and 2022, we're heading up at a rate of knots. So it has changed very fast. And I reckon by, 90, by 2030, we're either going to find that climate change isn't as bad as we thought, and it, the climate changes, but life goes on, and people will relax a bit, or we will have some really massive incentive to start to do th very radical things. And then, of course, with a bit of luck, the technology will be there to, um, to do it. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, applying that um, climate data to the, the seaborne trade forecast, this is my sort of mid-range projection. 
seaborne trade slows down quite a bit. It go, it gets, it's got up to 12 billion tons. It creeps up to 15 billion tons by 2050. Um, and I've got a, I've got a pointer on this. Uh, no, it doesn't work. Um, but you'll notice the energy commodities are all at the bottom of the chart. And um, the, what that, uh, the, the little table, the, sorry, the little table in the middle of the chart shows is the billion tons of cargo, um, which is to do with energy, and the carbon footprint. And in fact, that energy cargo generates 15 billion tons or generated 15 billion tons of carbon in 2021, uh, and the world's total carbon was 33 billion tons. So, you know, we're carrying half the world's carbon um, on the ships. And I'm not saying that's nothing to do with us, but if the world really does start to get serious about not using carbon, then it would have a big impact on sea trade. Um, the potential for green fuels, well, I, I'm going to move along a little bit here. My main point really is that there's a great big green energy gap. Um, the, the, the line is energy in exajoules. I, I mean, it's not a number that everyone carries in their mind, but the exajoules um, is shown uh, f from fossil fuels, is shown by the blue line. The bars show the clean energy, that's uh, solar, wind, um, uh, um, hydro, and nuclear. And the forecast is actually, I took it from a projection that BP did uh, in the middle of last year. Um, maybe then, uh, I thought it was probably a fair enough projection. Um, and what it shows is for the next 30, 20 or 30, 20 years, there's going to be an enormous gap between supply of uh, green fuels and uh, uh, the um, requirement to use fossil fuels. And if we just turn that into electricity, you, this chart is now in terawatt hours. The bar is world electricity. The, sorry, the line, the blue line is world electricity uh, consumption or production, and you can see that we're producing about 13% from renewables at the moment. So there's a very long way to go before we have enough to supply the world. And right now, the car in the, the gasoline um, consumption in 2021 had an energy content of about 14 um, uh, thousand terawatt hours, which is about half of the world's electricity consumption, and we're just about to move gasoline and cars into electricity. And so the cars are way down the road and well ahead of the shipping industry. So I think it's, it is, you know, the shipping industry is going to have to be in a queue for green energy, and there is not going to be enough to go round, and I, I think it probably will be quite difficult. Um, and of course, it's going to be expensive to, I just did the calculation to see how much, um, I, I think Gregory mentioned um, putting solar panels on ships. If you put windmills on ships, you'd need um, 30, 12 me uh, megawatt t turbines um, in order to produce enough electricity to drive, uh, to generate the 400, methan uh, the 400 um, tons a day of methanol you need to drive this ship. And that would cost, the, the windmills would cost $790 billion. And the, run the operating cost of the wind farm, which has a lot of overheads, is $60,000 a day. I went through this very carefully with one of the main offshore uh, consultants, and that's, the, the, that's what they came to. So um, this is... Uh, and that's just the electricity. You've then got to, t to buy the carbon dioxide or obtain the carbon dioxide, turn it into um, the um, methanol, which is an expensive process in itself. I never quite nailed down a number for that, but I'm still working on it. Um, other ways to phase out carbon. Well, uh, one really quite good one is nuclear propulsion. It's not here today, but it, I'm pretty confident that um, nuclear reactors for big ships will be around in the 2020s. 
Uh, this is a, the, the pictures, a test facility um, for the operating parts of a molten sulfur reactor, which, they, which went into test phase in October last year. They're expecting to have a small um, nuclear reactor um, test one in 2026 and a commercial reactor in 2032, 2033. Uh, and they're talking about 20 to 70 megawatts capacity, which would fit a big container ship quite nicely. Um, the cost, um, well, the, the numbers they quoted, uh, it was $150 million for the reactor, um, $250 million for the fuel, but when you DCF that, the, number one, um, you get, believe it or not, you don't use much of the fuel. After 30 years, you can decommission the ship. Anyway, I'm not going to dwell on that because I, I'm running short of time, but um, this, I've got plenty more information on that. The other one is um, carbon capture, which is a bit like um, sulfur scrubbers and I, I was talking to someone yesterday who uh, Stenner, uh, you, Stenner's data was used by a, quite a big study to come up with a plan and basically the, it, there's four stages uh, in this particular technology. You cool the exhaust gas to 40 degrees, you absorb CO2 into a mixture of um, MEL which is uh, unpronounceable chemical. Um, you then um, scrub the CO2 out of the MEL water mixture by putting it through um, a scrubbing uh, tower and you heat it up to 180 degrees, 120 degrees, and then um, you have to compress it, I think, I don't know, to, uh, or, or refrigerate it and find somewhere to store it. Um, it's you know, it's very, very challenging because you get an awful lot of carbon from 20 ton, uh, you know, 200 tons of heavy fuel oil. It's three tons of carbon per ton of heavy fuel oil so, or carbon dioxide. So you've got a lot of waste, much more waste than scrubbing sulfur. Um, it's out there. And, you know, I mean, the guys at Stenner seem to think it might... It, they, they, what somebody said to me was that it was... It, it was a bit like ballast water management, which cost uh, $20,000, $15,000 a day when it first came out, but it ended up at, on a new building at one to $2,000 a day. So I, I wouldn't rule this out. Um, you've still got to get rid of the, um, uh, the, the carbon, but, you know, that's what business is there to do. Uh, so there's two other alternatives which um, I think are both worth keeping an eye on. Uh, in terms of investment, you've got to build the ships. And I guess I won't dwell on this because many of you will have seen this chart before, but we've got a great spike of ships to replace sometime in the 2030s. So you're going to be getting into the phase of actually building green ships in, the 20 th in large numbers in the 2030s. And... Um, uh, uh, basically, in the 20s, you're sort of tinkering around trying to make the best of the ex existing technology. Uh, uh, and so you're looking for the silver bullet in the 2030s. And, you know, I, I'd say probably for the very big ships, container ships, the nuclear is, is about the best bet on the table. And it may be by then we'll get a ready supply of green fuel at a reasonable price. So, but you don't have to worry about the 2030s so much. The big thing is to get through the 2020s. And I believe the important thing to do in the 2020s is to start building businesses that can deal with the technology. This is a period of change. You're not going to be able to get away with two people in the office for every ship at sea if you're going to be struggling with all this technology. And the best way I can use, I've got 28 seconds to go. <laughs> um, and I, 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 I know lunch went on, so I'm going to go very quickly. I found this report about two years ago. It was done by a Danish organization on retrofitting. I, I read it and thought it was interesting. But the fact that they only covered three ships, but it was done in a lot of detail. And it, these were ships owned by big companies that you would have thought would have had 
all, the, all mod cons on board. And the reality was that if you read this study, you'll find that there was a lot of things that you could do. And so my advice, really, or my thought, is that you concentrate on your existing fleet. On my model projections, as long as we get some green ships in the 2030s, half the carbon emissions in the next 30 years will come from ships on the water today, and another 22% oh, these percentages, you know, on, um, uh, from ships which will be built in this decade with these existing technologies. So really looking at, looking very hard at um, this is well worthwhile. What this report says that um, owners who have systematically improved existing ships are more knowledgeable to spec new ships with financial savings and they're really better equipped. Uh, and, and in doing that, they actually build the organization because if you really seriously do retrofitting, you're going to have to get an awful lot of people in the organization involved in doing it. It's not just a matter of, you know, this looks good, we'll do that. You have to do it to, to everything, find the focus areas. And I won't go through it, but you'll get my slides later. But these are some of the things the report mentioned. It's not everything, and these were th but I, th I, I, I found myself um, quite, quite convinced. So, I mean, on that note, you know, I, I think I'd pick up a theme um, uh, that uh, Demetrius Fifalius said in one of the sessions, you know, it's about people. Although everybody in the sessions this morning talked about mostly about seafarers, I would say it's the seafarers sail the ships, but it's the people in the organization who manage the process and should not be neglected. I think people are the future, and I sincerely hope that um, you're the guys. Thank you very much.